Father, we are grateful to you for who you are, for your beauty and majesty and goodness and magnitude and jealousy and wrath and holiness and invisibility and sovereignty and omniscience and omnipresence and holiness and grace and kindness and love and mercy. Lord, we are thankful for who you are. We pray that you'd help us as we gather this afternoon to understand who you are better, that you would take our hearts and minds and be transforming them as we understand what it means to know you and to be good theologians. So help us, Lord, in these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Page five in your course back. We have talked about what it means to know God. We've talked about the importance of knowing God. If we're ever going to love Him and be the people He calls us to be. Now I want to talk about theological method. Do you know I desperately care that you understand theology better when you leave here? But do you know I care even more that you are better theologians when you leave here? I want you to be more able to do theology well even then that I'm concerned you know all this theological content we're learning. So you're going to be theologians the rest of your lives and even if you miss something now, if you have good theological method, if you know how to do theology well, you can return to this subject matter and learn it, understand it. And so I want us to understand the theological method. I want us to understand how we get to theological conclusions, in other words. Now you've been doing theology your whole life. You've been asking questions about God and seeking answers and finding answers. And so you've actually done theological method all along. You've just probably never stopped to think about, well, exactly what do we do to get to a good answer? So you ask, what does God think about sexuality? What does God think about war? What does God think about grace or love or justice? What's true about the Holy Spirit? A any question you have, what, what does God teach us about angels? And you go to the Word and you need to be aware of the process you get, go through so you can get to those answers with credibility and integrity and biblical basis. And so I just want us to understand a process you've tacitly known probably for a long time but just have never thought about what you do. So when we do theology, the first thing we do is seek to know God from His Word. And we go to God for that. We don't just depend on our own wits, our own experiences, we go to God, His revelation, which we have in the Word. And so we start with God. He's the source of what we know about Him. And that means we start with the Bible. The Bible is the inspired and authoritative Word of God. It's where all theology begins. It's our constant referent point. It's the Word of God. It is the ultimate source, the, the grid through which we understand everything else. This is God's definitive revelation of Himself. All theology begins here and has as its constant referent point the Scriptures. Now, if we're going to do theology from these Scriptures then, the first thing to do is to make sure we have accurate Scriptures. And you do that by understanding which copies of the originals are the most accurate. Do you know what that science is called? Who whispered it over here? Joe, did you whisper that? Textual criticism. textual criticism. Yes, why did you whisper it? Say it with confidence, my friend. Yes, uh, textual criticism gives us reliable copies of the original. And textual criticism is this fascinating science that studies copies. And you think, wow, how could you ever know if a copy is accurate to the original or not? It's actually not that complicated. There are only about seven ways we get copies wrong, typically. And they're actually not that hard to spot. Uh, and so a textual critic, a good one, can spot an error and what kind of error it was and then determine which copies are uh, the best, which ones are most accurate, reflective of the original. Uh, you learned about this probably in OT and NT, yes. Talked about textual criticism, manuscripts. Uh, and th the manuscripts of the Bible are miraculously accurate. This idea that, oh, well, we can never know what the Bible said anyway. Haven't you played the telephone game? You know, that after four people, the message is so distorted, you have no idea what it said originally. Well, that's just not true. Uh, 
and even non-Christian text critics will tell you that, that the manuscripts we have of the Old and New Testament are amazingly accurate. Far more so than any other ancient manuscripts we have that we base solid history on. And so, so textual criticism gives us uh, accurate copies that we then have our translations from that we do our theology from. Yes? Okay. Once you have good, good, accurate Bibles, then we start the theological process by doing what we call exegesis. Literally means to draw out of. Exegesis, as I'm sure you've also learned, is this drawing out of a meaning, uh, out of a passage, the meaning that it's teaching. When we say passage, what do we mean? If, if the subject matter of exegesis is a passage, what is a passage? What is that? Why do we call a passage a passage? Hillary? It's a chunk of, of scripture. Good, a chunk of scripture. But we pick the chunks with reason. What is the reason? Okay, based on the content of the chunk. And what is it about that chunk of, of content that makes us say, that's a paragraph? Oh, it's a paragraph, yes, that's, that's a passage. What is it about a paragraph or a passage that makes it a paragraph or a passage? A yeah, good, Shelby, yes. It's a complete thought. There's a self-contained unit of thought there. Now, to understand it well, you've got to understand what came before and comes after, but it's got a standalone quality. That's why I know you've written five-page papers and then realized, oh, this is a five-page paragraph. I need to go back and figure out where paragraphs are, and I hope they're there, or otherwise I don't have a logical flow of thought in this paper and I need to redo things, right? You've had that experience, I bet. Because paragraph is a self-contained unit of thought. It, it has a standalone ability. And so exegesis dives into a passage and draws out the meaning. Yes? And you use all the good tools of hermeneutics to do that, of, of uh, understanding of the language and the literature, the kind of literature and the historical background and the audience of this letter or, or portion or the author's intent and all these things, right? You apply all those things, historical background to understand a passage well and do good exegesis. Yes, this is the bedrock of doing good theology. If you can't get the micro sections right, well, how are you going to do the big picture? So exegesis is the starting point. Yes, good. Shall we move on? The next step in getting to theological conclusions is what we call biblical theology. And biblical theology finds answers to theological questions within historical sections of the Bible. Those historical sections are made up of passages. But when I say historical section, I mean we pay attention to the nature of Scripture itself. This is in your notes. Did you, uh, uh, yeah, all these definitions in your notes, right on page five. Uh, so the nature of Scripture is historically grounded. God doesn't just drop propositions about himself out of heaven. It's not just a dictionary of theology. It's not a systematic theology. It is the record of God's revelation of himself to real people in real time over time. The term is diachronic. It's through time. It understands God's revelation of himself and everything he thinks is important for us to know through time. So there's a progressive, historically unfolding nature to God's revelation. Yes? So that means we respect that. And therefore, we pay attention to this progression by paying attention to the historical sections on the way to the whole. So what would a historical section be then of the Bible, for instance? What do you think a historical section would then be that represents a, a piece of that overall picture? What do you think, Trout? Exodus. Good, beautiful. Either Exodus, the book of Exodus, or the Exodus that Exodus talks about. Could be seen as this, this again, somewhat standalone uh, uh, understanding of God from this event. Good. So, Exodus, or uh, any book of the Bible, right? Now it's easy. So, it could be Exodus, Leviticus, Genesis. It could be a collection of books like the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. It, it could be the wisdom literature, it could be just be Psalms. Anytime you ask a theological question of one historical section of the Bible, you're doing biblical theology. 
Has anyone ever read a biblical theology then? Probably not. We tend to neglect this step in the process and not even really be very aware of it. But even to understand a passage well, you need to understand it in light of its historical section, yes? So this means we want to hear Jeremiah's voice before we step back and listen to Paul's voice and impose that on Jeremiah, right? We let it unfold. We let it be historically unfolding and progressive. So we pay attention to each section's voice and the contribution it makes to the whole. So now we'll move from just knowledge to understanding. So then, give me an example of a question a biblical theologian asks. Now we move from just knowledge to understanding. Now we, give me an example of a question a biblical theologian asks. What would that sound like? Theological question of a historical section of the Bible. Show. What does the book of Acts tell us about the Holy Spirit? Oh, what does the book of Acts tell us about the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. That's a good question, and that's actually a question that shows understanding of the book of Acts, right? And you find that you can only ask certain questions of certain sections. So say you wanted to do a theology of the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of John. You know what you'd come up with? Nothing. It's not in there. Although, he replaces it with what? Do you know? The foot washing at the Last Supper, which maybe tells you a whole lot about what's happening at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and maybe it does have something there. But you ask a, a theological question of a historical section, now that show got us going, with what does the book of Acts teach us about the Holy Spirit? Now we could do this all day, right? Somebody else give me another example of a question a biblical theologian asks. Good, what does is, what is the book of John teach us about God? Good. Now it's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? You ever shoot fish in a barrel? It's really easy. They have nowhere to go. <laughs> Just like the answer to this question. It's really easy now. We can do this all day, right? Give me another one. Really? Come on, it's like looking at fish in a barrel. It's, it's not that hard. Um, what's another one? You all should be just giving me an avalanche of, of examples. Really? What does Leviticus teach us about holiness? What does the Old Testament teach us about the glory of God? What does the New Testament teach us about justification? What does Paul... Yeah, you get the point? Yeah. Right, real easy. Yes? Okay. That's biblical theology. Vital step in the theological process. Questions? Now, and only now, are you able to do good systematic theology. And good, uh, this is an example of George Eldon Ladd's New Testament theology. So his section is the New Testament. And on the way to his New Testament theology, he breaks that up into its historical section. And so he looks at the synoptic gospels and the issues that naturally arise out of those. He looks at John's gospel, which, which has a different, uh, some very different content than, the, than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he looks at the major theological themes that arise out of those. Same thing with Acts, Paul's writings and the epistles in the apocalypse. See how different that table of contents is than Grudem's. He's looking at the New Testament and then his sections within that and drawing the theological themes that arise out of those, yes? So now systematic theology is able to back up and ask the whole Bible question. That big question, all right, what does this mean? Biblically, whole picture. So now we're finally getting to not just what's this section's contribution to our understanding of God, the Holy Spirit, justification, the church, war, sexuality, whatever. You're asking theological questions of the whole Bible now. Doing good exegesis and biblical theology along the way, but finding whole Bible answers and realize how important this is. Until you do that, it doesn't get in the streets. It doesn't get in your life. It doesn't get in the pulpit because that's got to be getting into your life. You're only on your way to the whole Bible. This is God's view of this question once you're doing systematic theology. That's why when people say, oh, I hate systematic theology. <gasps> well, defined this way, do you really even have that option? Do you really want that? Of course, no, you love systematic theology because it gets you to the place of answers.
and the ability to minister out of those answers and live out of those answers. And so we're finding theological questions within the whole Bible, from the whole Bible. You know, as I've been working with this uh, Grand Canyon theme as we go, because it's like the exegete is looking at rocks and boulders down, down here, and then the biblical theologian moves beyond that and d- does what? Stay with the metaphor. What would, you, what would the biblical theologian do? What's that? Okay, yeah, you hop on a donkey, right, and ride through. Don't ride those donkeys. They're nasty. Uh, and, uh, just hike down. You'll be fine. Um, but yeah, get on a donkey or start hiking and see the waterfall and the section or the sheer cliff, right? So then what does the systematic theologian do? Yeah, stay with, so what does he do? How does he do that? Gets in a helicopter. Yeah, that's good. I, I'd pick a helicopter. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, he gets in a helicopter and takes in the whole thing. Now, if that's all the systematic theologian did, she wouldn't have a good understanding of the whole of the Grand Canyon, right? You might actually get some distorted ideas if you never go down and say, oh, that's what, that, I, that's what I saw from the top. That was a waterfall. I just saw something glimmering in the light. Now I know it's a waterfall because I went down and checked it out. And unless you do the, the smaller component parts, the, the, the bigger sections, and then the whole, you're not really getting the lay of the land. And that's what we've got to do with the scriptures. And this is hard work. Lazy people can't do this. It's hard work. Because the, the difficulty of the Bible is also the richness of it. It's not just facts and propositions. It's historically revealed truth. And so you've got to get into that historical perspective to understand it well. And then and only then can you back up and, and see the big picture. And so systematic theology is that place where you finally answer the whole Bible question that gets in the light. Got to do it. And we believe the Bible has an ultimate author and therefore ultimately unified answers. And not just a collection of differing perspectives that disagree with each other. So some people view the Bible, but we believe God's the ultimate author of all of it. And so we go to it for cohesive, unified answers. Allowing for ambiguity when that's what God has chosen to give. Or uncertainty or no answers to some questions. And then we let him set the agenda what the questions are. But we go to the scriptures assuming an ultimate author and doing systematic theology. Okay, questions about this? You know one of the few places you still see, in my view, good systematic theology done is in good African-American preaching. There's plenty of bad African-American preaching, but if you've heard a good African-American preaching, they actually take you through this process. You know what I mean? They start talking really slow, typically, (laughs) on purpose. Oh, that's a rhetorical genius right there. You just start slow, and you build, right? And you really don't go through an outline. You you teach the same thing in just an expanding way, in a more intense way, right? Well, I hope you've heard good African-American preaching, because it's priceless. And it it does this process. Because what will happen? You know, they'll dig in a passage. Some churches say, ah, we don't... uh, uh, We like topical preaching because we want it to be relevant. And then you feel like, but is this really coming out of the Bible? I know it's helped me have a better marriage, but and this sounds wise, but you're not showing me it's really coming out of the Bible. And they sprinkle in Bible verses, so you kind of think it does, but are those verses even teaching that? And then churches will react against that and say, we don't do this topical stuff, we're exegetical. We dig in a passage and that's what we do. But, But then sometimes you get the sense of, they do this, right? And it's just, You're going to understand this passage. And they never back up and help you. And so they'll study Revelation, verse by verse, passage by passage. And it's like, I wonder if the locusts are Huey helicopters and if the bear is Russia. And and you never do this. Oh, God wins. That's what Revelation's about. That's what the Bible's about. So you know, because you never back up. But a good African-American preacher, if you heard it, He'll start in a passage. Maybe it's from one of Paul's epistles, you know, talking about the faithfulness of God. And he'll unpack that for you in its context. But before he's done, he's not quiet anymore. 
You know why? Because he does this. God is faithful according to this passage in Paul's epistle. And this faithful God is the same God who was faithful to his people when they rebelled against him in the garden. And he came to them in their guilt and nakedness and clothed them. He's the same faithful God who was faithful to Abraham and came to him in his old age and said, you're going to have more children than the stars. It's the same God who fulfilled that promise and established the covenant and he brought it through Moses and was faithful to him even though he had been in the wilderness for 40 years and his people in Egyptian captivity for 400. God was faithful and he came to Moses and he met him in a burning bush and he never left him. And it's the same God that was faithful to those Jewish boys in a foreign land. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't need to fear because the faithful God was with them in the fiery furnace and he was with Daniel in the lion's den. And it's the same God who kept that promise to Adam and Eve in the garden and sent his only son, Jesus, who was the seed, who did come and crush the head of the serpent. And he's coming back one day to take us home. That's how faithful it is. And before you know it, you've got reason to shout, right? You're, and you are. You're shouting because it's not just Greco-Roman backgrounds of this passage. And it's not just have a nice marriage with biblical principles. It's a picture of God, right? who's at work and on the move and is still faithful just like he was back then. And that's why they shout, right? Because you got something you can live out of, not just say, interesting. Well, that's interesting. I better jot it down. It may be helpful at some point. No, when you preach like that, oh, then you get up and shout, right? Because you got something to, to live out of and you get a picture of God as it's intended. Now, it goes along this process. What I just did for you is, is what you do here. You say, here's a passage. I need to understand it. I need to understand it within its biblical theology framework. I need to understand the faithfulness of God as it unfolds throughout all the scriptures. And see, that's when you start to get the big, glorious, majestic view of what God and he's doing in the world. And that's when you get excited to be a Christian. Otherwise, it's teach me how to have a tidy life. All right. Actually, Dr. Phil does a better job than most pastors with that. So just listen to Dr. Phil. So, yeah, this is vital that we commit to this and get this. Uh, understand how it works. Now, you've been doing this, and you've sort of absorbed the theological method. Now it's not important just to know uh, what it exactly is you're doing and if you're doing it well. Okay, questions about this theological method? Yeah, it only becomes useful if, if you're men and women of the Word. If you're not doing little snapshots of the Bible here and there just to get a boost, that you become biblically saturated, that you have an understanding of the Scriptures where when something is presented to you, said, you read, you see in a movie, you listen to a song, you're in a conversation, somebody challenges your faith, you have the ability to step back and actually draw from a whole Bible perspective that you've absorbed in your life. That's called biblical discernment. That's called having understanding of what the scriptures teach from God's perspective. You obviously don't often have the ability to, to go through this lengthy, exegetical biblical theology. I mean, it took me three years to write that book on jealousy. That book on jealousy is a biblical theology. It is this that does this that gives you what you need to do that. Yes? So it, you'll see, when you read it, watch the theological method. It walks you through exegetically his section. So the, it goes to the Exodus, in Exodus, but also when the Exodus is referred to in the Psalms, say, or in the New Testament even at times. But we're looking at this historical section saying, what does this teach us about the jealousy of God? And then we look at just the priesthood. What is the priesthood and the way God separates a people for himself? Teaches about the jealousy of God. And, and we look at it in a biblical theology method that then gives Grudem the kind of raw data he needs to write half a page on the jealousy of God in his systematic theology. But standing behind that half a page is all this good biblical theology and exegesis. Not that he actually used the book. It was written after his his systematic theology was, but um, 
but, but that's the process that, that we need to go through to get good, solid answers from, with biblical integrity. All right, other questions? About this, you got it? Just a few quick uh, notes along the way. As we do this, let's pay attention to the history of the church and do what we call, uh, oh, this is Millard Erickson's uh, systematic theology, his um, Christian theology table of contents, similar to Grudem's, not like Ladd's, the biblical theology. Um, you see he asks those big questions, drawing from the whole Bible, not, not focusing just on historical sections, but drawing from the whole scriptures. Person of Christ, see how that goes. Um, when we do systematic theology, it's important to do all along the way historical theology, because people like... Calvin, thank you, and Luther, and please get this one. Wesley? No. Jonathan Edwards. Good. Yes, he's from Connecticut, like your professor. I'm both from Connecticut. And that is Bob Sosie, a Talbot prof, who belongs up there, even though he cringes when I tell him he's on that list with those guys. Um, Good theologians have spent their lives doing this and sometimes given their lives doing this and for what they came up with, and so we need to pay attention to what they did. Thankfully, we don't start theology from scratch every time we do it. And, but, but here's the thing. Unless we can do this ourselves, we can't even evaluate how well they did it. Now, we, help, we get help from them in doing it, but we need to be able to do it ourselves to even be able to decide whether or not they came to good conclusions when they did it. So historical theology is important to contribute to the process the whole way. Practical theology is important, and it's theology. Some of you are majoring in a discipline within practical theology. Like, what do you think it might be? Christian ed? What do they call it educational ministries? What do they call it? Christian ministries. Christian ministries and lead it. Christian ministries? Good. That's a, that's a discipline within practical theology. But you don't stop doing theology. It's not about... Uh, how do we do PowerPoint? I don't think you might talk about that. It's, it's a theology discipline, right? It's a theologically driven, how do we get all this good theology effectively into the church? How do we, how do we communicate with a theological motive and philosophy, theologically driven, how do we do this well? So if you take a class in ICS, intercultural studies is practical theology, a preaching class, a class in evangelism. How do we get all this good teaching out? with a theological agenda. And then uh, the, the pulpit, you know this is? The Prince of Preachers. Yes, Charles Spurgeon. Um, this is just a, a picture of church leadership needs to be theologically driven, theologically concerned, concerned that the people in the pews are becoming better theologian and, and know, theologians and knowing God and His ways better. And then we're miserable failures if we stop there and don't get where? Where does all this need to go? The world, yes. If we don't take all this theology across the streets and to the nations, we're miserable failures. It was never intended to be a bunch of smart people in the pews. It was intended to be people who get the truth out into the nations, into the world, making a difference for the cause of Christ as His kingdom advances. So that's where it's all got to end up. All right, that's it. That's Theological Method. I want you to become better theologians. These disciplines are interrelated. They're never done in isolation, ideally. Even exegesis, I mean, you want to hear that passage in what it's saying without hearing unnecessarily imposed uh, other voices in the Bible. But no, for an evangelical who believes there's an ultimate author, you don't ever do exegesis independently of the whole Bible picture. The whole Bible picture actually helps you to do exegesis well. We do that prematurely sometimes and, and for instance, force Paul's voice on Jeremiah's too soon without, without waiting to synthesize until we really hear Jeremiah. Uh, but exegesis needs, as evangelicals, be informed by systematic theology and systematic theology needs to be grounded in exegesis and good biblical theology. And all along the way, you keep asking, well, how did the early church fathers do this? What conclusions did they come to when they did this? What did, what did the, um, the Anabaptists or the Reformers or particular theologians, what did they think? At every step along the way. So when I prepare a sermon, I'll read Calvin's commentaries and how he exegeted a passage. 
And, and I'll, I'll read early church fathers. I'll read Augustine and see what they said about these things. Because I want to be informed by them. And so, so this just informs the whole part of the process. And I would say exegetes as Christians, biblical theology and systematic theology, needs to be concerned about practical theology too. Because people come off the mission field and say, wow, it's really hard to communicate this theological concept to these people. How do we contextualize it well? When are we compromising the truth and when are we just contextualizing it? And, and so it's a theological process. And so, so it, it, it flows this way. Now, maybe even having this go that way is, is a mistake, but because historical theology needs to inform the process every step of the way. But it, it does tend to have this. And, and so academic theologians, uh, trained theologians like all of you, need to be deeply concerned about church leadership in the, in the, the, just the average Christian sitting in the, in, the, in the pew and ultimately the world. You've got to have a Great Commission concern. I don't want a Christian exegete who doesn't care about the Great Commission. Don't feel, you know, oh, I just do second, uh, uh, first century exegetical work. Don't talk to me about reaching the nations. No. We've got to have a concern about this whole, whole process. But at the same time, realizing that you can focus on some more than others in, in the time you spend doing it. Okay, other questions or comments? Yeah. How does um, philosophical theology... Oh, great question. I really should have that up there. Philosophical theology, like historical theology, I have it defined there for you in your notes, is another discipline that helps us think well all along the way. Because as you exegete a passage or do biblical theology, you keep asking questions that require good logic. Does this make sense to understand it in this way? So what does it mean to make sense? And philosophical theology helps us think about those things. And even when we get to systematic theology conclusions, and then we, we want to communicate it well, philosophical theology helps us communicate that well. And, and we'll come up with ways of describing these truths that go off road maybe from the clear biblical revelation, but are helpful ways of describing it. Because philosophical theology is, is theology based on our reason. Um, and so it gives us helpful ways of thinking well all along the way. Yes? Okay. All right, got it? I so want you to get this process, understand it well. It's like, it's like an orchestra. You need a, if you're the conductor, you need to be able to hear and know if this instrument is playing well. And you also need to know how that section's doing and e how each section is doing before you back up and hear the symphony. And systematic theology is the symphony. Exegesis is the instruments. Biblical theology is the sections of the or orchestra. And, and so the symphony is when you finally back up. But you won't have a good symphony unless you pay attention to the component parts of it. And you want them doing exactly what they're doing. You don't want them rushing to do what another, another section's doing or another instrument's doing. You let them speak with their own voice, as it were. Okay? Marcel just asked, sort of his methodological question, the whole time you want to be not only teaching people about this, what this passage or this theological idea is, the whole time you're you're subtly teaching about the authority of Scripture and the unity of Scripture. So every time you, you preach or teach or, or, in, or instruct in some way out of the Scriptures, you should be implicitly bolstering confidence in the Scriptures themselves by the very way you teach them. See, when you just have an idea and sprinkle passages in, you're not really strengthening people's uh, trust in the Scriptures, belief in the authority of Scripture and the clarity of Scripture and the unity of Scripture. You're actually undermining it by just sprinkling stuff in uh, rather than showing it's coming out of the Bible itself, yeah? Okay. All right. Um, I, on page... Oh, uh, on page six, just really quickly, uh, these are the major, tip, classical major, major categories on, in systematic theology. Now, these aren't explicitly biblical or inerrant or anything, but as you read the Bible, you say, all right, major themes arise out of the scriptures, like the word of God itself, like who God is, like uh, what a human, a human beings, and who's Jesus, and who's the Holy Spirit. So these big ideas emerge out of scripture, and these are the fancy names that they've been given over the years. Uh, I don't give these to you so you can use them very much at all, if at all, but just because you need to know them because people use them. And if you're sure people know them, well, then go ahead and use them, but only if you're sure, and then 
I'm still not convinced you have to. Um, I mean, why say ecclesiology with people who might not know it if you can just say the study of the church? You know what the Bible teaches about the church. Uh, but these are the major categories. Yes? Okay. Uh, now, as we study theology, it's so important to have a discernment about how important different teaching is. Uh, there is relative weight with different doctrines. Some teaching is more weighty, more important, uh, more central than others. And so to think about this, I just want you to have this sort of grid. You have what we call absolutes, core doctrine, that really define Christianity. Things like the Trinity and the deity of Christ and the inspiration of Scripture. Um, salvation by faith. These, these ideas that are at the core of the Christian faith. They define Christianity centrally. But then you, if, if you step back and say, all right, that's the most weighty. Well, what is weighty but not as weighty as absolutes? And we could call those convictions. These are things you hold strongly that really matter, that make a difference biblically, but not to the same degree as absolutes. So these don't necessarily define whether or not a person or a church is Christian or not, but these sorts of things, convictions like uh, gender issues or gifts of the Spirit or your view of baptism, these sorts of things uh, will determine what church you go to, what ministries you support, what mission agency you support or go on the mission field with, They'll, they'll decide who you marry, too. You know, if, if, if you believe the miraculous gifts of the Spirit are active and you practice them, and you're thinking of marrying someone who thinks they stopped at the end of the New Testament, that's going to cause some issues on a daily basis. Right? And so, so convictions, we can say both of those individuals are believers and Christians and know Christ, but this is a weighty enough issue to say, wow, can you go into a marriage or a, a ministry relationship and feel really good about diving in? Uh, so convictions are uh, that second tier category. They carry importance, but not the same weight as absolutes. Then we've got a category I'd call opinions, where it, it's not as important as convictions biblically, but you still have opinions and maybe even strong opinions about it. You may put, put things in opinions like baptism. Now, I put baptism in both of these categories just now. Because if it's baptism um, in a Roman Catholic or Protestant sense, well, maybe that should be a conviction or even close to an absolute. But if it's baptism in a Baptist or Presbyterian sense, is that an opinion or a conviction? Well, these are the kinds of questions we need to ask. Um, is, is there a difference between Lutheran views of baptism, Presbyterian views of baptism, and a Baptist view of baptism, or a Quaker view that doesn't do baptism at all? And I considered joining a Quaker church once, but because baptism isn't something they practice or teach, I just couldn't do that. So, uh, some Quaker churches do, but the thoroughly Quaker won't. Uh, but, and so there are opinions you have. Now, opinions may be about um, things that others don't consider important enough, but, but that's why we need to just think about these categories and then how we go about determining what goes where. And then I have a category I'd call questions. These are things that you don't think the Bible determines clearly. That it gives you a definitive answer on, and so you suspend judgment on. You think that's a question, maybe a good question, maybe a helpful question, maybe a question you need to seek to answer, but you don't think the Bible gives you a definitive answer enough to make a, a clear decision on it. Uh, these are the categories. Well, how in the world do you decide what goes where? Because it's not only the case that you need to make some determination about relative weight because there are decisions to be made accordingly. Like, do I want to go to that school that teaches that conviction I differ on? Do, is it important enough to go in a doctrinal statement for a school or a, or a church? Uh, do, I, do I want to link arms in ministry with folks that I have these different opinions or, or convictions on? Are there some issues, say, fighting abortion, that I can link arms with people on that have different absolutes than I do. So, so lots of questions to be asked in, in weighing your relative weight of things. How do you decide it? Well, you know how we usually decide it? How do you think we usually decide this stuff? How do we usually decide that that's important and that's less so? How, what's the typical way we do it? 
How do you think you, you've typically done it? Yeah, the opinions, it's sort of what your church pounded on or didn't. It's what you, you sort of intuitively feel is important, or what your family made a big deal out of. It. Very seldom we step back and say, yeah, well, how do we decide, biblically, where things belong? Well, this is important. Um, what issues do we divide over and which ones do we not see as worthy of dividing over? That's a really important question. Because not only do we need to decide where things go, you know, there are some absolutes that are closer to the core than others. Right? There's some convictions that are closer to being absolutes than others. There's some convictions that are closer to being opinions than, than convictions. So some questions are much closer to being answered in your view than others. So how do you decide where that goes? Well, I, the, here are some suggestions I make for how you decide where stuff goes. Top of page 8. First you say, how clear is the Bible on this? Is this, is this based on some obscure, two obscure passages that are really hard to understand? Now, some people find passages hard to understand because they just don't like what they teach. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basing a doctrine like Jesus' descent into hell on this very difficult passage in Peter's epistle where he talks about Jesus preaching to the saints in Noah's time, and whoa, what is going on there? Yeah, and then Peter has the nerve to say, Paul th says things that are hard to understand. And then Peter writes about Jesus descending and, and preaching to the, 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 the souls in Noah's day. What is going on? So do I base a doctrine with weight on an obscure passage? So biblical clarity. Relevance to the character of God. Very important consideration. Does this teaching affect in some way the way I view God? Now, everything in some ways connected to the doctrine of God. Everything. But some things more directly so. What relevance does this have to the essence of the gospel? Is, is salvation and how we appropriate it at stake with this teaching? Remember, I went to a paper once at a theology conference on this idea of the relative weight of doctrine in the New Testament. And it it was so often issues that messed with salvation that, that New Testament writers get really ticked. And the subtitle of the paper was um, Evangelicals, Evangelicalism's Boundaries in the New Testament or When Jesus and the Apostles Got Really Mad. Stuff that they really saw as important and planted a flag on often were related to whether or not you had access to God through the work of Christ or not or if some people were adding things to it. Like... Jesus flipping over tables when they're selling stuff, making it so the Gentiles can't get into their precinct where they get to, to be part of this whole thing, or the Judaizers adding circumcision to faith, right? Jesus and Paul are ticked in both of those settings because people are messing with access to God through the gospel. So, um, biblical frequency. How often is this taught in Scripture? If something's taught once in Scripture, that's enough for us to believe in and obey it. But when we talk about the relative weight of doctrine, something that's taught a lot in Scripture deserves, deserves to be considered in light of that and its weightiness. Effect on other doctrines. Some, all doctrine has an effect on other doctr all other doctrine, but some more dramatically so. Consensus among Christians, past and present. How have Christians thought about this idea in the past? If you come up with a brand new idea nobody's ever thought about in Christian theology in the last 2,000 years, you are wrong. Now that doesn't mean sometimes the minority has the truth and the majority's missing it, like I believe in the Reformation. But this needs to be weighed. This needs to be considered. And notice, these don't stand alone. They're all weighed. It's like you keep throwing uh, weight in a, in a wagon as you're trying to make a case for the weightiness of a doctrine. Um, affected as another doctrine, consensus among Christians, and then two more. Effect on personal and church life. Your, your view of the timing of the tribulation has an impact on your life. But nothing like your view on whether or not it's okay to openly practice homosexuality as a pastor of a church. See, you might want to say, well, the second coming, that's pretty important. Well, on this issue, number seven, some have immediate dramatic impact on daily life and in the church. Um, so pressure to compromise coming from contemporary culture 
uh, is, is another one I would add. We are, we are challenged and pushed to, to compromise some teachings. Now, there are times where a teaching deserves a flag planted partially because there's such an effort to get a rip away from that teaching. And you need to hold the line on it because that's where the pressure's coming uh, again. So, so again, you don't, just because there's pressure, make it bigger than it is, but it does need to be considered. So these are the eight ways I think we need to think when we try to decide where something goes in these categories. Uh, I really want you to know this because Christians desperately lack a good discernment in these things. The church has tended on its never-ending pendulum swings to, to either tend to turn questions and opinions into convictions or absolutes or turn absolutes into convictions to just questions and opinions. And, and we tend to, to uh, go one way or the other on this as a church and as individuals. Uh, and we need to make sure we're paying attention to these sorts of ideas when we try to decide objectively where they, they should be, how much weight should be put in a doctrine. Yes? Classifications of the attributes of God. Broken down into incommunicable and communicable attributes. The communicable broken down into five subcategories. Being, mental, moral, purpose, and summary attributes. This is how Grudem laid them out, right? When you read those chapters in Grudem, that can be like drinking from a fire hydrant. It's important to back up and say, well, what's the big structure here? What's the big framework that all of this is hanging on? And this is what it is. This, you should come out with notes like this when you read uh, without having to be provided, uh, give them, have them given to you like this. So uh, you see these attributes. These are classifications, but we quickly reaffirm the unity of God's attributes. We don't slip into a pedal theory of God's attributes that considers them independently of one another. Ferris taught you about this. Yes, the unity of the attributes. Um, and we have reaffirmed this because once you give somebody a list, especially as finite creatures, we tend to isolate these attributes and think that we get this list down, we get God down, and we lose a holistic and personal and interdependent view of the attributes of God. That's why at the bottom here I, I reiterate the unity of God's attributes. Yes? Okay, then on pages 14 and 15 are a, a condensed treatment of 30 attributes and, and their definitions. This is a starting point of understanding these and a, a jumping off point that we then understand in the rest of our lives. You, you don't have to memorize these for this course. You do for my Character of God class, but not in here. But would you please memorize them sometime in your life, maybe before August? Before the fall semester starts, could you just please say, I'm going to have those attributes memorized. And you wa will watch the effect it will have on your worship and prayer and ministry uh, because you have a better understanding of what these basic words we use for God really mean. It's amazing how seldom we stop and think about basic definitions of words we use all the time to describe God. Even good. You know, we say, God is so good. And he is good, you are good, and you're lo And we don't stop and say, well, what do we mean when we say good? Anybody know what we mean when we say good? Without reading, just reading it to me? I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, good. Would anybody thinking about it, can you think what that might mean? Isn't that funny? It's about a basic word as you're going to use for God. Here's a good starting definition. All God is and all God does is fully worthy of approval. So when you see something about God, it deserves a standing ovation. When you watch him do something, it deserves a standing ovation. It's not like figure skating. Ooh, not quite. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't quite land that perfectly. It's like figure skating and gymnastics drive me crazy. I'm like, whoa, oh, that was a disaster, they said. <laughs> Look good to me, man. I, I couldn't do even that at all. I couldn't even do that in a dream. Never mind. It's, but oh, no, boy, did she blow that landing. Really? Look good to me. Oh, a little ice came up. And you'll never do that with God, right? <laughs> you never do that with God. If you're seeing him rightly, he always gets a standing ovation. That's what it means to say he's good. 
so how important it is to have these definitions. And so please uh, know that you need to study them, though. You don't need to memorize them for this course, but you need to know them. You need to study them to the point where you could even tell me the nuanced difference between mercy and grace, which we tend to just use interchangeably. But once you realize that grace is God's kindness toward those who deserve only punishment, and mercy is God's kindness toward those who are in misery and distress, you say, oh, okay, lots of overlap, but an important distinction. So please know these well, study them well. And then pages um, 16 through 30, we're not going to go over in detail in this course. But I want you to know them. I'm trusting you have this content. I get so frustrated that we don't have time to dive into these like they deserve that I teach a whole course on them called The Character of God. Um, so that whole course is these pages. But, but we're, we're going to approach it a little differently than just going through all of these, uh, which we'd love to do if we, if we had the time in a semester. But we have so much we have to cover. So uh, know these well, although we're not going to pour over them in class. Okay? Okay. What we're going to do to dive into the doctrine of God is biblical theology. Ah, I love to be able to say that and know you all know exactly what I mean. We're going to do biblical theology in this course, in this class time when we seek to study the character of God. And, and here's, here's our biblical theology question. What does the book of Exodus when it uses the names of God, teach us about God. So what do we learn about God in Exodus when God uses names for himself? That's the biblical theology question we're asking. Yes? Do you all understand that? that we're going to listen to Exodus in naming God to understand better who God is. See the theological method we're going to do? Good. So... Um, Go to Exodus 33. This, this story of the Exodus is, is massive in the Bible. It becomes the, the picture of Christ's work in the gospel that's carried into the New Testament. It becomes a paradigm. I mean... Passover and Jewish observance is, is out of this story. And, and so much of what we know about God is out of the story. But there's a fascinating process that Moses goes through in this story. And I want to start with the goal. I want to start with the ultimate goal in our hearts and minds and lives. And then back up and see how we get there. Here's the goal. The goal is to think and feel and talk like Moses does in this passage. You know what's happened. You know the story. You've seen Prince of Egypt, right? You know about the Egyptian captivity and the burning bush and taking on Pharaoh and the ten plagues and, and the Passover and the Red Sea opening and letting the nation through and then close up on the Egyptian army. And then you know that just days later, they're worshiping a golden calf in a pagan orgy at the foot of Mount Sinai. And you know God's anger and Moses' prayer and God relents and he reestablishes the covenant with Moses here as a great act of mercy. And Moses is desperate. He needs help. He needs encouragement. He needs hope. And watch where he goes from it, for it, exactly where we need to. Moses said to the Lord in Exodus 33, 12, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please, now, show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And listen to what God says. And my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Listen to Moses. He's got it, guys. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. 
For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do for you, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And listen to this question. It's the question. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. Guys, that's the question of our lives. I think you could define a Christian as someone who's asked that question and has beheld the glory of God ultimately in the face of Christ. Show me your glory. Give me an understanding of the manifestation of your presence, of your glory, of your power, of your, of your majesty. Show me who you are so I can be hopeful and faithful and confident. That's what we need. That's the question we need to be asking. It wasn't always this way for Moses. Go back to ch chapter 3. You know how it starts out. Go, Moses, tell Pharaoh you want to take on, uh, take the very basis of his economic system out of Egypt. Go ahead. And Moses is understandably stymied by this command. And look at verse 10 of Exodus 3. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And note what he says. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God says, Moses, you're the man. You got skills, Moses. If you don't have your Bible, that's not what he says. <laughs> he also doesn't say, Here, Moses. Take this gifts assessment survey and you will see how gifted you are to take on Pharaoh. He also doesn't say, here Moses, take this personality inventory and you will see that you have the perfect personality for this ministry. He doesn't say, all right, you're right. Let me give you a seminar on eight ministry principles for effective leadership. Now guys, I'm not minimizing the importance of all those things. I'm just trying to put him in perspective. It's about knowing God and not asking, Lord, show me my glory, but show me yours. That's the basis for us. But guys, Moses isn't there yet, is he? Look at chapter 4, verse 1. But Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. Look at verse 10 of chapter 4. Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But Moses says, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Ah! He doesn't get it. Look at chapter 6. Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised or faltering or incomplete lips. And look at verse 30 of chapter 6. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. I am faltering lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? It's still about Moses. Moses is living in a radically Mosocentric world. And he needs to be radically God-centered. A theocentric world is what he needs to move to. So when we go to 33 and hear him say, you know what, if you don't go with us, don't even send us. Would you show me who you are? Show me your ways. Please let me see your glory. That's the question. He's arrived. He, he's not done, but this is a massive place in his life. This should be Moses' life verse, you know, his mother should have engraved it on the little basket she launched him in the Nile in, right? Exodus 33, 18, please show me your glory. That's your life verse, Moses. Now, hadn't been written yet. He had to grow up to write it. But if it had been written, that should have been his life verse. Because he gets it, right? He still needs to continue to get it. And he struggles with that at times. But this is massive. And this is what we all need to get to. We need a shift from our very natural and fallen inclination to be human and self-absorbed 
and then become God-absorbed and God-centered and God-focused, and then we will have the kind of confidence and hope and joy He intends for us. Help us, Lord, in this. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.